Okay, praise the Lord. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for Thy faithfulness. We thank Thee for always answering our prayers. As Thou hast said, Thou would never leave us nor forsake us. Our trust is in Thee, O Lord, as it is better to trust in Thee than to put confidence in man. We thank Thee that Thou art a rewarder of them that diligently seek Thee. And we seek Thee this day while Thou may be found. As newborn babes, we desire the sincere milk of thy word, whereby we may grow thereby. For in this even sanctify us with thy truth, for thy word is truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Before we hear from the preaching of God's word once again, I would like to give a testimony. Let us turn to the Bible's book of Psalm. Psalm 37. This 37th Psalm. Verse 4. Psalm 37, verse 4. Praise the Lord that we serve a living God. As we walk with Him day by day, we always have testimonies to tell. Praise the Lord. Once again, back where the Lord sent my wife and I to Honolulu, Hawaii. He ordered our steps to the Door Faith Church. And the Door Faith Church, they had services once again before on Sunday morning and Sunday evening, Monday evening, Tuesday evening, Wednesday evening, and they get on Friday evening, praise the Lord. And at the Door Faith Church, in every service, he had to give a testimony. And they used to preach in the pulpit of that church, if you don't have a testimony to tell, you must not be saved. For the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Are you redeemed? Are you saved? Then you have a testimony to tell. You've got something to say. And in Psalm 37, verse 4, it is written, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Praise the Lord. Back in the year 2002, a Christian sister, a sister in Christ from Brazil, blessed me with the computer desk, because back in 2002, we used one of those big computers. Had to have a computer monitor, and then the CPU, and then the keyboard was big. And with such a big computer, you needed a computer desk. And this sister in Christ was led of the Lord to bless us with a brand new computer desk. It was very expensive at the time, very heavy. I remember I moved it by myself and almost broke my back moving it. Praise God. But, as I believe in using the floor, and don't believe in sitting in chairs because it throws the back out, and you would not believe how many people today have their backs thrown out as they sit behind a computer desk. I used it for about a year or two and realized it's very bad for you. Because you sit behind a computer desk, your back is thrown out, your back is arched the wrong way, you relax in that chair, and then you see people walking around, they look like Frankenstein. Look, something wrong with them. Their back is out. And if your back is out, your whole body is out because your spine is one of the most important parts of your body as all your nerves are attached to your spinal cord. And once your back is out, then those nerves where the, where the vertebrae are out in your spine will then be affected and it hurts the rest of your body. So we see people who walk around like this. They're very sickly. They always get something wrong with their physical body because their back is out. You've got to take care of your spine. you got to take care of your back. Where did I learn this from? Of course, from the martial arts. Because the same thing works with the martial arts. Your punching power, your kicking power, all comes from the back. So back when I was tie boxing for a living, those who are not tie boxers would see me with skinny arms, Skinny little chest, see me as a skinny person. They say, you're a Thai boxer? They wouldn't believe me. But at the Thai boxing gyms, the managers, the promoters, the trainers, they all knew I was a boxer because of a big back and big shoulders. You want to know if somebody can fight? You want to know if somebody can hit hard or hit, hit you, knock you out? You look at the shoulders, look at the back. And a person knows how to use their back and use their shoulders. And that's why my back and shoulders are big because they knew how to use it. And they put that behind their punches and their kicks 
They'll have knockout power as they'll have their whole body behind their punches and their kick. They'll put their back into it, their spine into it, which is where your whole body is at, the center of your body. But if your spine is out, if your back is out, if somebody throws punches, don't use all their back, or throw kicks, don't use all their back, they'll have no power behind their punches or kicks. And if a person has their back out, then their body will be sick. They'll be very sick. They have all kinds of physical problems. And I found that sitting at a computer desk and chairs are very bad for you. So though we have this computer desk, I stopped using it years ago, only use the computer on the floor so it keeps your back straight, keeps your back muscles working as there's nothing to lean back on and then you don't get sick and your body is strong. But we had this computer desk for years. Nobody wanted it. We couldn't give it away if we wanted to back then. We tried to give it to people. Nobody wanted it because now everybody's computer is real small and skinny and you don't need a computer desk that big. But praise God yesterday, without us having to advertise, yesterday somebody bought that computer desk from us because they wanted to put it in their room. As the room was empty, all they had was a bed and a, and a, a, bed and a closet, and they wanted something else in that big room. So they bought the computer desk from us, praise the Lord, and gave us much more than what we ever thought we'd ever get from it. In fact, we tried to give it away years ago. Nobody wanted it for free. And then somebody bought it from us yesterday without us having to advertise. And we got blessed with much more than we could even have imagined our guests would have got for that computer desk that we received for free years ago. So praise God once again. Psalm 37 verse 4. Delight thyself also in the Lord. He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. God gives us the desires of our hearts. Praise the Lord. Let us return once again to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2. Beginning verse 14 once again that is written. But Peter... Standing up with the eleven, lifted his voice and said unto them. This past Friday is a preaching online sermon from the roof of this building. We looked at verse 14 in which the apostle Peter stood up with the eleven and lifted up his voice to preach the gospel to all those souls from around the world that were gathered to Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. And we saw what a blessing it was for Psalm 133, verse 1, that is written, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for a breath and to dwell together in unity. And then, of course, I testified what a blessing it is here in 2017. We have fellowship with brethren, brothers and sisters of Christ, all over the world. And what a blessing it is. At different times, God will touch different ones' hearts to send us a blessing. Praise without having to ask, beg, hint, tell anybody of our needs, because they're brethren, they have the Holy Ghost. As the Spirit leads them, they give to us, and it's always right on time, and at the right time, when it's from the brethren. Praise the Lord. We also saw what a blessed it is when you have the brethren with you in unity, such as the Apostle Paul. We saw there this past Friday that the Apostle Paul preached the gospel, and they stoned him to death. The unbelieving Jews, they dragged his body out of the city, supposing he had been dead. That should have been the end of the Apostle Paul's ministry. That should have been the end of his life. But what happened? The next verse says in Acts 14, verse 20, the disciples stood round right about him, and he rose up. Because of the brethren, because of their prayers, though he had been stoned to death, he could rise up and continue to preach the gospel and finish the course that God had given unto him because of the brethren. Praise God. Verse 14, But Peter sent it with the eleven, lifted his voice, and said unto them, Peter did not preach on his own. Preacher was not a lone wolf. He was not a lone ranger. He was a sheep. And sheep need sheep. Sheep never go off on their own. Sheep need other sheep. And when Peter preached the gospel, he had the 11 other apostles standing with him. Not only is it a blessing, it is also a need. Why is it a need? Because what if Peter says something incorrect? 
What if preached Peter preached something false? What if Peter preached something that wasn't from the Bible? Maybe came from his own mind, his own understanding. The Bible says to trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not to your own what? Lean not to your own understanding. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Holding your finger in Acts chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. It is written... Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. How many people today attempt to preach God's word based on their own understanding? They read the Bible and they see something some way they think is correct and they preach it that way and they're wrong. They're not led by the Lord. They preach things the Bible does not say. They'll put scriptures together from different parts of the Bible that should not be put together as they take scriptures out of context. What's the Apostle Peter warn us about? 2 Peter. In the book of 2 Peter. Chapter 3. Begin at verse 15 and verse 16 that is written. An account of the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. That beginning part of this verse is a sermon by itself. The long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, has also in all his epistles, speaking to them of these things, in which some things are hard to be understood which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own their own destruction. They twist the scriptures. They rest or twist the scriptures, making the Bible say things that the Bible does not say by putting certain scriptures out of context together, which is false. Acts chapter 2, verse 14 Therefore the apostle Peter, sending with the eleven, lifted his voice and said unto them, Not only they have the eleven other apostles around them, which is a blessing, for behold, how good and how pleasant is for brethren who have unity, they were there to keep them in check. This is why God does not bless lone rangers or lone wolves out there on their own. you got to have the brethren around you. you got to have brothers and sisters grace who can correct you if you do anything wrong. If you say things that are wrong, if you teach or preach things that are wrong, or do things that are wrong, God uses the brethren. We are sheep, and sheep need one another. Therefore, the apostle Peter had this blessing with the eleven around him to keep him in check. In fact, there was a time the Apostle Peter did a false practice in the book of Galatians. In the book of Galatians, chapter 2, beginning in verse 11, the Apostle Paul, writing this mission of the Ghost, writes about something the Apostle Peter did that he had to rebuke him about. <clears throat> Acts chapter 2, verse 11, when Peter's come to Antioch, I was stood him to the face because he was to be blamed. The apostle Paul had to withstand the apostle Peter to his face. Does that mean the apostle Peter is no good? Does it mean the apostle Peter, he's fired, he should quit, he should give up? No. Just because sometimes it may go off a little bit and somebody corrects you, get back in line. Christianity is not for those with a thin skin. Because the Bible teaches us to rebuke one another. That's love. Open rebuke is better than hidden love. And if you're thin-skinned and can't take rebuke, you can never make it as a Christian. The Bible says that iron sharpeneth iron. We're to sharpen one another. God uses the sheep, the brethren, to correct us. In fact, the Word of God is given what reason? And all scripts give inspiration to God is proper for correction, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness. God's word is given by inspiration for correction. And those that preach God's word will correct you when you do something wrong, say something wrong, preach something wrong, or teach something wrong. And if you're thin-skinned, you can't take correction, you'll never make it. I have seen those who have attempted to do the work of an evangelist and failed. Fail as an evangelist. Why? They're too thin-skinned. 
They couldn't take correction. They get offended. And then they try to preach the gospel, and people may say things to them. They get offended about that, and instead of preaching the gospel to save souls, they're out there trying to win arguments. They're out there trying to win debates. They're out there trying to win other people. Instead of win souls, they're out there trying to win debates, win arguments, to go out there and say, I'm right and you're wrong. That's not the way the servant of the Lord must be. The servant of the Lord must not do what? The servant of the Lord must not strive, must not argue or debate. God has not called us to win arguments. He has called us to win souls. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 11, but when Peter's come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James to eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he were Jew and separated himself, fearing them which are of the circumcision. And the other Jews just assembled likewise with them, insomuch the Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. When I saw they walk not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou be a Jew, livest in the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why can us of the Gentiles live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature, not the sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Praise the Lord. The Apostle Paul withstood the Apostle Peter to his face and rebuked him before them all. Verse 14. And I said unto Peter, before them all, he was stood in the face and rebuked them before them all. Did the apostle Peter get offended? Oh, he embarrassed me. He made me look bad in front of everybody. Now they're not going to think I'm an apostle no more. He made me look bad. I hate that apostle Paul. He made me look bad. No, the apostle Peter was not infantile. Why must we say this? Because the land we live here in Thailand, many people are infantile. They do a thing called, in Thai, they call it laksana, saving face. Saving face, another word for that in English is infantile. Somebody's word about saving face is acting like a child. And here in this country, Thailand, many act like children, infantile. The word about losing face. And if you rebuke them before others, as the Bible commands us to do, they get mad and upset at you. You made me look bad. You hurt my feelings. You made me look bad in front of everybody else. Now they're going to laugh at me. Now they're going to mock me. And they get offended by things like that. You'll never make it as a Christian if you have thin skin. You'll never make it as a Christian if you're easily offended. Now, Christianity, you've got to stand like a man. You've got to be bold as a lion, and you've got to be able to take rebuke. When the Lord Jesus Christ walked this earth, we can read throughout the Gospels many a times, Him rebuking His disciples over and over again. Christ rebuked His disciples. And why did the Lord Jesus Christ continue to rebuke them? Where is thy faith? Oh, ye of little faith. When, when, when Jesus Christ continued to rebuke them, why did he do so? Because he loved them. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Christ quotes the Old Testament, which is written, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But the scripture quotes from the book of Leviticus, right in the same scripture says, To rebuke your neighbor. And then tells you, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. If you don't rebuke your neighbor, you don't love your neighbor. If Christ didn't rebuke his disciples, he didn't love his disciples. And if you don't rebuke the brethren, that means you don't love the brethren. Therefore, we see here in Acts chapter 2, the apostle Peter had rebuked the, the apostle Paul, had rebuked the apostle Peter, and the apostle Peter never got offended by that and took the correction like a man. Acts chapter 2, verse 14. Therefore the apostles, Peter, said of the eleven, he lifted his voice and said of them, he had the eleven other apostles with them, standing with them, keeping him in check. If he preached or taught anything wrong, they'd be there to rebuke him. If he did anything wrong, they'd be there to rebuke him. And if that happened, would the apostle Peter get offended? We saw from the example of Galatians, he would not get offended, but accept the rebuke and take the correction like a man. As the Bible commands us to quit you like men, act 
like men. Men don't get offended. Men are not thin skin. Men are not infantile or little babies who worry about losing face. Men can take correction and move on, just like in prize fighting. When you enter into the ring, again, it's not a one man show. Every prize fighter enters into the ring with what you call an entourage his training partners, his sparring partners, his seconds, the quarterman, his chief second, his chief trainer, and then here in Thailand, your owner. You actually have an owner. You're a Hokana, your owner, because you're owned when you box here in Thailand. So you come in here with a whole entourage, you get to the ring, and that entourage out to the ring, what are they doing? They're yelling at you the whole time, correcting you when you do things that are wrong, because they can see things outside that you can't see in the ring. When you're in the ring in the midst of combat and fighting, you can't see everything. Your vision is parallel. All you can see is your opponent. But outside the ring, your trainers, your coaches, your managers, your owner, every time they have an owner, and all the ones outside, they can see everything going on inside the ring because they're outside the ring, and they can tell you what you need to do. Back in 1993, I was invited to teach Thai boxing in Las Vegas and lived there for about six months teaching Thai boxing. It was a very hard time because though I'd been boxing only three years in Thailand, I'd made a name for myself as I made it on Thai TV. And back in those days, when I was boxing on Thai TV in the early 90s, there was only five channels on the television. Channel 3, Channel 5, Channel 7, Channel 9, and Channel 11. That's all you have was five channels on your television. So whenever the boxing came on TV, every one of the men would watch the boxing because that's all the only five channels. And of course, a lot of the women and old people didn't watch the boxing. The children made them watch cartoons, but every man would watch boxing when it came on TV back in those days, early 90s. So when I had fought on Thai TV and Thai boxing and main events, every man knew me. My wife remembers those days. After I finished boxing, the next day walk on the street and all the men would be talking. There he is. He just fought last night on TV. All the men would be talking about me when I walked on the street after fighting on Thai TV. So I had five channels at that time. So I made a name for myself and they invited me back in 1993 to teach Thai boxing in Las Vegas. You see, in America, in the early 90s, the kickboxers were converting to Muay Thai, Thai boxing. And it made a name for itself in the television, in the movies, and all the different fights around the world. And the kickboxers were all being converted away from other martial arts into Muay Thai or Thai boxing. And so then they invited me to Las Vegas to teach all these kickboxers how to Thai box. It was very hard because they developed bad habits from their kickboxing that you could not take in the Thai boxing. For instance, in kickboxing. Then they keep their left hand low, almost like a boxer. Keep their ten chin chuck behind their shoulder and keep this hand close and tuck it so they can throw that jab and whip it out there with their kicks. This will not work in Thai boxing because if you're left-handed and you keep that left hand low and you're fighting another fighter, if you're not left-handed, you're right-handed, so you have the left foot forward, and you're fighting with your left hand low and your opponent is also fighting with his left foot forward, that means a strong leg is right leg is going to be kicking at your neck in Thai boxing. And if you keep that hand down low, he's going to take your neck off. And though you may hide your chin behind the shoulder like boxers do in Thai boxing, the shit will just hit your shoulder, ricochet off, whack you in the ear, down into your neck, and push you to sleep for a long time. Well, as I was trying to teach these kickboxers not to do that, they would get mad. They would get offended. They turn into crybabies. They turn infantile on me. It became that so impossible to teach them to keep that left up because they don't look themselves in the mirror. And when they put that left hand down, they see their face in the mirror. And they can make faces oosh, oosh, and look real good in the mirror. And they like to see themselves in the mirror. People with their left hand up, you can't see yourself in the mirror when you're shadow boxing. They didn't like doing that. So finding to remedy the situation instead of kicking everybody in the neck which would have been dangerous to do and to get sued. I was in America where they sue you for everything you do. What I did in 1993 was we had a video camera, the VHS tapes, videotape, video camera, and I would video the training session and then watch it on the VSR and television outside the training hall after training so they could see themselves. And it worked. 
Many of them saw exactly what I was saying they're doing wrong because they got to see themselves outside. They got to see what they look like from the outside. On the inside, they thought they're doing everything correct. Nobody can knock them out like this. Then they watched the video and saw, oh, you're right. I'm open. You kicked in the neck. I didn't see that. You're right, Tony. Thanks. And then they started converting into Thai boxing. And then I left and came back to Thailand and could not take teaching those people in America Thai boxing anymore at that time in 1993. You've got to have people around you. Not only is it a blessing, is God can use them to bless you and exhort you, He can use them to correct you. And you've got to be able to be corrected. If you ever get to the place where you think you cannot be corrected or nobody correct you, you're going to fall, as the Bible says in the book of 1 Corinthians. Maybe not 1 Corinthians, maybe it's in 2 Corinthians. See if you can find the scripture. Take heed. They may think there's something unless they fall. Hmm. Not even quoting that correctly now. It's either 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians. I thought it was 1 Corinthians. I'm going to go back there again. Hmm, that's not it. But it warns us about Christians who think they are standing lest they fall. There's Christians that think they're, they're something. Nobody can correct them. Yeah, I'm going to find this scripture right now. Have you guys found it? The scripture that warns us that you take heed. Find it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Thank you. That perfect. Exactly. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Once again. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. If you think you can stand your own two feet, if you think you know it all, and nobody can correct you, take heed lest ye fall. That's called pride. And pride cometh before a fall. You've got to be able to be corrected by others, especially the brethren. Take heed. Wherefore, take, let him that think he said it, take heed, lest he fall. Acts chapter 2, verse 14. Therefore the apostles stood with the eleven, lifted his voice and said to them, He stood up with the eleven, knowing he's a blessing the breath that are right about you, a blessing for them that pray for you, a blessing to bless you, the Lord leads, to exhort you, but also to correct you. It is important to be corrected. And sometimes the Lord will use the weakest Christian, the Christian you wouldn't think much highly of, the Christian you may think is foolish, he may use him to rebuke you. The Christian may even be struggling. He may say things to you that may rebuke you. It may be from the Lord because God speaks through the brethren to correct you. And you've got to be willing to listen. You've got to be humble to hear what they say to you and to take correction and not be thin-skinned, but be a man thick-skinned and take correction. See, you cannot take correction. You can never make as a Christian. You will fall. You will not make it. That is why you need the brethren around about you. In my walk with the Lord for the past 22 years, God has used some of the most foolish in the eyes of man, Christians, to correct me at times. I remember back in the door of Faith Church, I was rebuked for using the new King James Version. You see, at that time, I thought I had a King James. I went to the Bible store, asked for a King James Bible. They gave me a new King James. I went to the church thinking I had a King James Bible and got rebuked in front of everybody. But praise God, that rebuke back in 1997 got me into the Word of God, the authorized version of the Holy Bible, and I've not got of it ever since. Praise the Lord. And it was an old lady 
that God used to rebuke me. As I was giving my test for the door of faith church from a new King James Bible, she yelled and says, does anybody got a real Bible we can hear? I didn't get offended by it. A real Bible? Was something wrong with my Bible? What Bible you got? In the real Bible, let's hear what he has to say. Oh, mine's different. What's your Bible? This is the King James. What's mine? That's New King James. Oh, this isn't the King James? I received that correction, got into the Word of God. And that's just one example of many that God has to use Christians, the brethren, to correct us at times. Here, the Apostle Peter was standing with the eleven. And they were there to keep him in check. They were there to keep him in line. The apostle Peter did not preach on his own. He was not a lone wolf or a lone ranger. And I have found that those who like to preach by themselves that are lone wolves or lone rangers, the reason why they do so and they stay away from the brethren and whatever excuse they may use is because they know they're false. They know that brethren around about them correct them and they don't want to be corrected. They've been corrected too many times. They have heard it too much. They've been corrected so many times they want to stay away from Christians. They all know they're all wrong. They keep trying to correct me. I'm right and they're wrong. And that's why they like to go off on their own and be out there as a lone ranger or a lone wolf. As I've been doing the work for an evangelist for 22 years, I do not believe in lone rangers. I do not believe in lone wolves. I believe in sheep. And sheep need sheep. I believe in serving the Lord with the brethren and not going out there on the own. And no matter who the brethren may be, if they're born again and have the Spirit of God, be willing to listen to their correction when God uses them to correct you. Like the Apostle Paul had to correct the Apostle Peter to his face at one time. And the Apostle Peter did not get offended, did not get upset, did not get mad. He took his correction like a man. Verse 14. But Peter sent up the eleven, left of his voice, and said to them, Ye men of Judea, and all that tell Jerusalem, be this known to you to hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, see this by the third hour of the day. But this is that which is spoken of the prophet Joel, and shall come to pass in the last day, saith God. I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and young men shall see visions, young men shall dream dreams. And all my servants and my handmaids are part of those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I'll show wonders in heaven above, and signs there beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned the darkness of the moon into blood before the great and noble day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Once again, from that day that Christ rose from the dead, which was a Jewish feast of first fruits, which followed the Passover, which Christ was crucified on, and he rose to the dead on the feast of first fruits until that day that Christ comes again, which no man know the day of the other Christ coming again, save the Father in heaven, until that day, the great and notable day of the Lord come. This promise stands fast that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yes, we're living a time of apostasy. Yes, we're living a time that many churches have fallen away. Yes, we're living a time in which the Bible warns us that they have departed from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. But no matter, in this day of apostasy, in this day that most churches have fallen away, this promise stands fast that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yes, it is the days of Noah today. The wickedness is great. Violence is all throughout the land. We see it's the days of Lot. Sodomy is on the rise and fornication. And people give themselves to fornication and go out their strange flesh, which is going to evoke the wrath of God to pour forth fire upon this earth one day. But until that day comes, this promise stands fast. The whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yes, we've gone through the streets. We see people have tattooed their bodies, tattooed their faces. Women are dressed like men. Men are dressed like women. People are confused which bathroom to go to because they look like a man looks like a woman and doesn't know which bathroom he should go to. And a woman looks like a man and she doesn't know what bathroom she should go to. They're all confused. They're all in sin. But this promise still stands fast. That whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It may be hard to find true Christians in church buildings today. 
It may be hard to find the remnant that God has preserved, but they're still out there. And even as they're still out there, though most churches fall away, this promise still stands fast that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We think we have it hard now. What about those Anabaptists in the 15th century in Europe? where they had to meet at nighttime on lakes or rivers and boats in secret because the Catholics and the Protestants would kill them for meeting in secret as the Catholics and the Protestants take over Europe. And if you're either going to be a Catholic or a Protestant. But the Anabaptists, they wanted the gospel. The Anabaptists wanted to follow Jesus Christ. And they had to meet at nighttime. They had to meet in rivers. They had to meet in parks and in, uh, in the woods. They had to meet far away from others. If they got caught, they'd be sentenced to death. Yet... God was still using them at that time. And this time we're living in is still the same. This promise still stands fast. That whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's not focus on the sad state of the church. Let's not focus on the apostasy. Let's focus on this promise of God. That whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And there's nothing impossible to the Lord. And God is willing for all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So they come up to us. The apostates want to argue and debate. We don't argue and debate with them. We don't fight with them. We try to get them saved. When the atheists, when the heathens, tattoos all over their faces, want to withstand us or preach the gospel, we don't fight with them. We don't mock them. We try to get them saved. Because whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And for these past 22 years, I've seen impossible cases call on the name of the Lord to be saved. Now you must not lean to your own understanding. You know, there's many armies that fight bad wars and lose. And the reason why they fight wars and lose is because they fight by textbook wars. And they go by the textbook. Do this, do that, play this, play that. And then they lose because of war. You've got to adapt. In combat, you must adapt. And if you don't adapt, even doing textbook wars, you'll fail those wars and lose those wars. Just like in the 1950s, they had the Korean War. The war in the Korean Peninsula. The North Koreans had invaded South Korea as both America and the Soviet Union had divided Korea, the Korean Peninsula, Peninsula on the 38th parallel. The North was communist. The South was democratic under America. And the North was communist under the Soviet Union. They'd been divided the 38th parallel. And then the North invaded the South and took over the South. The U.S. Army came in to defend the South and began losing the battles or pushed down to Busan or Busan down to the coast. But America had a general named MacArthur, General Douglas MacArthur. He did the impossible as he did throughout World War II. He went to the Inchon Bay, Inchon Bay, and did the Battle of Inchon, and he gave himself a 5,001 chance of success, yet he did it anyway because MacArthur went by his gut. He invaded Inchon, cut South Korea in half, won that battle, and the work is way down south, and then retook South Korea for democracy. The North Koreans went back to the north, up to the 38th parallel, and there at the United Nations Assembly, General Douglas MacArthur presented the capital of South Korea's soul to its first president, President Rhee. He presented it back to him. And then what did General MacArthur do? Then he made everybody in the UN Assembly stand to their feet, bow their heads, and he remained to recite the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And every one of those members of the UN they all said the Lord's Prayer after General MacArthur. See, he fought by the textbook. He had much experience. He went by textbook war. But then America invaded the North. They wanted to retake the whole Korean Peninsula for democracy. They invaded the North. They worked their way up. And now they had a goal to get to the, oh, what's the name of that river? The Yun Hu Yunsu River, the Yunmu, the river that separates North Korea and China on their border. He had a goal to take the American forces, lead the UN. America was leading the UN at the time, lead them up to that river and reclaim the Korean Peninsula for democracy. General George MacArthur met with President Truman at Midway and the Midway Islands and made a promise by such and such a day the Korean Peninsula would be one for democracy. But the Chinese sent 250,000 soldiers, a quarter of a million soldiers, into North Korea. And they did not attack. As the Americans were working on the up North Korea, 
take in city after city. The Chinese patiently waited for them. The leader of that army, Marshal Peng, was asked, What are you doing? Why are you waiting so long for? He said, When you bait a fish, you gotta let them taste the bait a little bit. Let them get used to eating that bait before you trap them. As the Americans made their way up to the north, they went to a reservoir, the Chosan Reservoir, and then the Chinese at nighttime attacked them. The U.S. soldiers thought it was going to be easy. They celebrated Thanksgiving. They're going to make it to the river by such and such a date. They're going to win. This war is so easy. They're having such an easy time. And then one night they heard the bugles. Flares shot in the air. 250,000 Chinese attacked them. And they had a, what they called, advance to the rear, the Americans did, and flee North Korea to the Japanese, to the Sea of China, to get back to Japan where they came from. And the Chinese retook North Korea. Why? Because the Chinese didn't fight war in my textbook. They did the People's War. Mao Zedong, the leader of China, he used General Sun Tzu's tactics of using the people. And Mao Zedong, under General Su, using General Su's tactics, said that the people are like fish, fish in the ocean, and you've got to use the people in the war. And that is going to raise up 250,000 to attack the Americans and win North Korea back to communism because they didn't go by the textbooks. General MacArthur then had to stand before the United States of America and give his final speech that a good soldier just fades away and is stepped down from being general, stepped down from being leader, stepped down from the U.S. Army, and faded away into history because of that mistake, that loss, trying to fight a textbook war. When you preach the gospel, it can't be textbook. You can't have in your mind, I'm going to preach the gospel, the person who agree with me is going to listen to me, and then I'm going to lead him in prayer and he's going to get saved. It doesn't work that way. No. It's usually the guy who's fighting with you who will eventually get saved. She's the guy who threatened to kill you. Maybe one day he'll get saved. It doesn't work by the textbooks. And you've got to adapt when you preach the gospel to win souls. You can't just go by the textbook. I'll say this, 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 and this. He'll respond this, 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 this. And then get saved because they're not going to respond that way. And then what are you going to do? You're going to give up and not have any souls won. You're not going to win any souls. You're going to see anybody get saved. In order to preach the gospel, you've got to adapt. And as I've been preaching the gospel for 22 years... I have seen the most impossible cases call on the name of the Lord, just like in 2003. Went to the Thai-Burmese border. There was a young man trying to play witchcraft on me. He didn't like me preaching the gospel. He didn't like me there at the border. He was a professing Christian, but he was not yet born again. And as most professing Christians from these hill tribes in Thailand on the Thai-Burmese border, they also mix witchcraft with Christianity. And they tried to use witchcraft on me to show all the other people that he was the one with the most power. He was jealous of me preaching the gospel. He didn't like me preaching the gospel. He wanted to show them he had more power than I did and began using witchcraft on me. I woke up in the middle of the night one night in the bed and there was this sharp knife. Now, of course, I grew up in the martial arts. I know about knives. You know, meat cleavers are good knife. You cut bones and hands off. But it's a terrible weapon, really, in a fight because you got to slash. And slash is easy to be countered. But this knife would have a sharp point at it. Because the effects of knives and knife fights and knife battles are knives you thrust and stab with. They're hard to counter. They're hard to defend against. And when you get stabbed, what they call shanked, and that comes out, you're going to die. It's going to bleed you right out. Even if somebody slashes you, you can sew that up real easy. You can take care of that live. When you get shanked or stabbed and somebody twists that, takes it out, you're going to die soon. This was a nice knife. I thought, this knife is not a mistake here in my bed. How did it get in here? And it's not a knife used in the kitchen. It's not a knife for cutting meat. This is a knife to kill somebody with. I tried to ask people in the orphanage, I'll say, anybody know where this knife came from? They all got scared. They'd never seen a knife like that before. Then other nights, I'd find these nails in the bed with me. And the place I was saying that was made of bamboo. There's no way nails fell down from the ceiling because it's all made of bamboo. And there was just nails coming from. And they're neat looking nails. They're different kind of nails. So I saved all that. Come to find out from a Mon tribesman as I was preaching the gospel in another village. And this Mon man and I were talking. And he showed me his weapons, his slingshot he used. And he had these homemade uh, projectiles he had made with some dung and dirt and mud, and he put out in the sun, so it solidified, and this weapon. I said, hit that tree up there. And I showed eye level at this certain spot. Whack, whack, right at eye level. I said, you're using it to kill some aren't you? Said, yeah. 
you aim for the eye, don't you? He's like, yeah. What's this made of? He's like, dirt, and dung, you know, poop. And all of a sudden, hit somebody in the eye, so I'm blind, them, it's going to affect them. That's a killing weapon. You put a new meaning to that slingshot there. That's pretty good. I had respect for that man, from that mod man. And then I said, what about this knife here? You know about this and these nails? He said, oh, yeah. That knife was used to kill somebody. Those nails, they're special nails they use for coffins. Somebody's playing, where'd you find this? In my bed at nighttime. So said, somebody's playing black magic on you. This is really strong black magic. He said, but for you, it won't work because you're a Christian. You see, this Mon Schreisman, he knew that black magic didn't work on true born-again Christians. So then why would he born again? Well, I'll tell you why. Preach to him. He thought he couldn't become a Christian because he believed in racism. He believed Christianity was for the white man, and he was Mon and dark skin, and he wasn't worthy, he believed, of becoming a Christian. He thought Christianity was the white skin. He was a racist, but not racist when his skin was on top. He was a racist thinking whites were on top, and he on the bottom of the totem pole, and he thought he was not worthy to become a Christian. I had preached to him, shown Bible scriptures, he still would not become a Christian as he thought he was not worthy because of his own skin color. Racism damns souls to hell. I'm against racism. There's no such thing as race. We're all the same skin color. We're all brown. And the sight of God, we're all the same as God is no respecter of persons. And this poor man, because of racism he had been taught, he thought he was not worthy to become a Christian. So come to find out somebody's playing black magic on me. They use a knife where they killed somebody. They use nails from a coffin. Well, I continue to preach the gospel. In 2003, we snuck into Myanmar, Burma, now known as the Union of Myanmar. We snuck in, because back then it was illegal to go into Burma and preach the gospel. We snuck into Myanmar. The Mon militia received us at the border, escorted us and protected us with armed bodyguards with Kalashnikovs, AK-47s. They had a stage set up for me to preach the gospel. Praise the Lord. And as I was preaching the gospel, I noticed a young man calling to the Lord to be saved. And those young men, he was really sincere. A lot of them were sincere, but this man was really sincere. And as I was preaching the gospel, he was down there crying out to God with tears in his eyes. That night, we got back into the Thai side of the border. He came to me with a jacket I still have, a Karen tribal jacket presented to me to apologize to me, to tell me he was the one that tried to play black magic on me. He wasn't trying to curse me. And now he's called on Jesus to save him and asked him, what must he do now to scared the black man to use on me would come back on him? I explained to him, if you truly call on the name of the Lord, you're saved now. And if you're saved, God will protect you. You don't got to worry about that black magic to the scriptures. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in this world. Then know what the form against you shall prosper. And preach these scriptures to him, hoping he truly did call on the name of the Lord, because the next day I had to go back to Bangkok. That was in 2003. In 2017, last month, I was on the Thai-Cambodian border in Chantanabri, Thailand. And I met this Filipina sister that I knew way back then. And she has married that young man. Not only did that young man get born again that day in 2003, not only did he call on the name Lord to be saved, he entered into the full-time ministry began serving the Lord, and this Filipina sister was running an orphanage. They fell in love together. They got married. They've had two children together and are still serving the Lord 14 years later. An impossible case. A man who tried to play black magic on me. Did I fight back with him? No. Did I try to get fist with him? No. When he came to confess, he played black magic on me. Did I get offended by that? I want to fight him or do something bad to him? No. I wanted him to get saved. When people punch me when I'm preaching the gospel, do I fight back with them? No, why not? Because I want them to get saved. When people curse me, when they want to argue with me, do I fight back, argue back with them? No, I don't do those things. Why not? Because I want them to get saved. When an apostate Christian will come in to argue with me, do I argue back with them, do I fight back with them, do I take the Bible and start hitting them over the head with it? No. I want them to get saved. I preach the gospel with them. I bless them. For the Bible says once again, 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. Verse 23. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender stripes. See, so if you see me in action, 
when people come up with these foolish questions or trying to set me up these questions, I don't get into that. Because it just leads to an argument, a fight. People come up to me and ask me this and ask me that, ask me that. I don't get into a fight with them. I don't argue with them. Because I avoid foolish and unlearned questions because they gender strengths. Because the Bible says in verse 24, And the servant of the Lord must not strive. If you see those going out there to argue, going out there to win arguments, going out there to debate with others and call that preaching the gospel, they're not servants of the Lord. Because the Bible says, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but what? Be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, not pride, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God prevents or give them the repentance of the knowledge of the truth, and that they may recover themselves of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. We don't go out there to strive. We don't go out there to argue debate. God has not called us to win arguments. God has not called us to win debates. He has called us to win souls. And when we preach the gospel, we have hope. No matter how impossible the case may look, no matter how possible it may seem, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. No matter if it's a man dressed like a woman or a woman dressed like a man, maybe they have tattoos from head to toe all over their face, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Maybe they're covered in religious Buddhist tattoos. We still preach the gospel of them. We're still patient with them. We're still gentle with them. Because whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. May they try to physically attack us. May they curse us. May they want to argue and debate with us. Maybe they even try to put black magic on us. We don't fight back with them. Because whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. There is no impossible case with the Lord for God is willing for all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of truth and that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Therefore we preach the gospel. There is no such thing as an impossible case. There is no such thing as that person who's too lost. So that person, no, he's no good. That person, no. there is no such thing as an impossible case. God is willing for all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth and all they must do is repent, believe, and call on the name of the Lord to be saved. Because before that great and notable day of the Lord come, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for thy faithfulness, for thy word is truth. And as whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, shall be saved. We pray, O oh Lord, thou hast continued to send us. We pray, O oh Lord, for our souls to be saved. Heavenly Father, it is our heart's desire to see souls saved. Send us, O oh Lord. Use us for thy glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord.